Planning on looking for work, son? My line of work is kind of hard to come by. Depends on where you look. Depends on who you are. I don't know. Some of the criminal types these days, they, uh, think that they're real cowboys. Think that they can just, uh, drive around, do whatever they want to do, whenever they want to do it. <laughs> I respect a man that's good at what he does. I'll tell you something else. I'm very good at what I do. Now, last night... Oh, I forgot. <laughs> His memory's not too good about last night. I remember everything. Alone in your room? Yeah. You can do better than that. I don't have to. Go ahead, throw it! It'll cost you two years. Go on. You want to throw it? Go on. Go on. Go on. Now, you know what I'm going to do? I'm gonna catch the cowboy that's never been caught. Cowboy Desperado. Now get out of here. Time to go to a bar, and the bar's got somebody in it thinks he's tough as a nickel steak. But they all come to speed for the do re me. Now get this. We ain't partners. We ain't brothers, and we ain't friends. My little brother was 15 years old. You think about that. You're waiting, you know. How about cutting heat? Oh, I get it. You want some kind of contest, huh? You're real smart boy, ain't you? I guess maybe you'll have to kill me. It'll hurt if I do. Well, it looks like I finally ran into someone that likes to play as rough as I do. Yeah, this must be a lucky night. And my body, they're not nice like me. Are we supposed to say thanks? You're not supposed to say nothing. Soldier. 20th Century Fox presents Two Men on Opposite Sides of the Law Ryan O'Neill Bruce Dern And between them Isabella Johnny Three loners playing a ruthless game none of them could afford to lose In The Driver Ryan O'Neill is the driver My line of work is kind of hard to come by his reputation, the best wheel man in the city. Did you ever get caught on one of your jobs? Hasn't happened yet. Bruce Dern is the detective. I'm very good at what I do. His reputation, the toughest cop in the city. You saw the man who was driving the car, yet you didn't identify him. You got a reason? I just don't like you. Well, you get out of my town, because you go out on one more job, and I'm going to nail you. You might be getting too big. Two men driven by their need to prove they were the best. How are you going to get downstairs? I really like chasing you. Sounds like you got a problem. I'm much better at this game than you are. You win, you make some money. I win. You're going to do 15 years. To them, the money, the law, even their lives no longer counted. You don't care about the money. Might even send it to him. 
who was best was all that mattered. In the ninth, and we've got the winning run on first. You've been set up, you know. To break the cop, the driver was willing to risk it all. To break the driver, the cop was willing to break the law. Go ahead, throw it! It'll cost you two years. Ryan O'Neill, Bruce Dern, Isabella Johnny, the driver. A ruthless game between two legends. Uh, hello, cowboys and cowgirls uh, of the road this time around. This is Last Call of Torchies. Uh, this is the, the, the definitive, or the our, our version of what a Walter Hill podcast should be, uh, I guess, because I've, do, I've done the research. I haven't seen any other ones just dedicated to Walter Hill. So we're, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're lone... So we're, oh, I'm sorry. We're the best. We're, we're the best around because we were the only one, so you're welcome. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I'm here tonight with uh, two gentlemen of your last show, and they're going to be here every show. Lee Russell is here. How you doing, sir? I'm doing really great, man. Um, looking forward to getting into this and talking about what may very well be my favorite crime film ever made. So That's a lot, of, a lot of crime films, dude. Uh, and Yeah, and I reviewed this on my podcast in a year where we did a shit ton of crime films, and... This is probably the top one, so, uh, yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Also with us tonight is Mr. Cameron Scott. How you doing, sir? I'm doing fantastic. I'm as equally excited as uh, the rest of y'all to do this one. Uh, this is, As I've said before, this is one of my like lesser-traveled uh, Walter Hill films, and after watching it again for the first time in years, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's because I'm just turned off by Ryan O'Neill, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I love a good crime thriller. I'm, I'm ready. Not even Paper Moon, dude? Come on, you got to watch that at least once. Um, <laughs> once was enough <laughs> oh come on man No, you like what you like and I, I will never down you for that oh yeah tonight if you didn't hear from the trailer and the clip and you know, all that good stuff uh, we're doing The Driver from 1978 is, is Mr. Hill's sophomore effort which we think is a pretty great one and we'll uh, get into the technical stuff about it and how it was filmed and all that good stuff and all the beautiful rides in the film I have my favorite. I'm sure these guys have their favorite, too. But um, this uh, stars a bunch of people with no names. You know, we have Ryan O'Neill as the driver. We have Bruce Stern as the detective. We have Ronnie Blakely, who, who is the, 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 the connection. We have Isabella Johnny, who is the, the player. You find out why she's called the player at the end of this movie, people. You know, mm-hmm. with them big old lies in this movie. Um. This, of course, is written and directed by one Walter Hill, and um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask Lee first what his initial his initial thoughts on it is. I love this film. Um, it's my most rewatched uh, Walter Hill film, I think. Uh, it might be in close contest with um, Southern Comfort, but this is this is one I watch a lot. Uh, first reviewed it on my podcast, like I said in 2017, and watch it for the first time like shortly before that and i've watched it several times over the the uh preceding years uh it's a great little like stripped down film i don't know if you guys are familiar with uh jean-pierre melville's le samurai from 1967 but uh this is a direct homage to that film the only difference being that that's a film about a hitman who is a professional who goes by his own code and it sort of carries himself above common criminals. Uh, it's, it's changed to a getaway driver who does the same thing, basically of Ryan O'Neill here. And I love how this plays out. I love all the little twists and turns and the, even though the characters are kind of sparse, I love the character motivations and how they interact with each other. And um, it's just an exciting stripped down minimalist sort of action crime film and uh it's very very fucking satisfying so uh it, it's just it's fucking great we'll get into the details but uh, i love this film cool cameron uh i think uh lee already said everything that i wanted to say. <laughs> 
you know, really, uh, except for this is not one of my more uh, traveled uh, Walter Hill films. I've seen this one, wouldn't say the least, but it's one of my lesser traveled movies. And like I said, I don't, I don't know why, why I haven't revisited it. It might be, like I said, the fact that I've uh, kind of turned off by Ryan O'Neill, but I love Bruce Stern. I love it. I, I love watching anything with Isabella Johnny. <clears throat> mm. And, you know, it is very minimalist. But that's not a detriment to it. <clears throat> it's not a negative. It's just filled with and with and oozes uh, style. You know, <clears throat> it's it's got great cars, great car chases. It's I love the fact that none of the characters have names; they're just kind of referenced by their occupation. Mm. And I had totally forgotten Ronnie Blakely was in this. I, I'd love seeing her in something where she's maybe not uh, known for just being an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> Nightmare on Elm Street, I'm looking at you. But it's, you know, it's filled with great characters, you know, uh, great cars, great chases, you know. And I think, you know, Quentin Tarantino owes a lot of his earlier styles and earlier couple of films uh, to movies like this, you know, and he himself has said that, you know, this is one of his favorite films and I think it shows, but you know, it's uh, yeah, it, it, it deserves more credit than it is given for sure. Yeah. yeah this is like a, like a fourth time watch for me. I, I watched it, you know, when I was, D- digging through in that first year of the beef just just to see you know which ones we were going to do this was on the list there's very few that were not on the list actually because we did a whole bunch of them um but those shows are lost now hence why we're doing this wonderful show with these gentlemen and um yeah ryan o'neill he doesn't sweat in this movie which i thought was a cool no. was a cool choice like <laughs> it, it was it was like he, he never he, he feels pressure like towards the end but like the whole time that opening scene where he's he's picking up these guys who are robbing the casino, and he, he's he's looking at he's looking at just looking at his surroundings to see where he can go, and the whole time, even when he's driving fast and evading the cops and playing chicken with the cops, he doesn't sweat. He he doesn't even change his facial expression. He just you know, he just goes, and it works so well in a movie like this. And um, <clears throat> like 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 a uh, like um. Cameron said, though, this isn't his normal type deal. This is the guy that started the love story a few years before. and Oh, God. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah oh, the... God. Oh, man. I was, I was about to say, he's, he's the direct opposite of that character, freaking out in that scene. It's just, <laughs> right, like, yeah. right. He's a cool cu- cucumber in this one. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. Yeah, the main event, Paper Moon, you know, stuff like that. He's kind of a huckster in Paper Moon, but he doesn't really need to say much of anything in this movie He's because he's he's calm and collected the whole time and i i think he this is a big departure and a big success for for him as an actor it just it works so well mm-hmm. um a lot of eyes in this movie i mean you get isabella johnny and you got ronnie blakely and you, you see that they're the beautiful women in this movie but you see eyes throughout the whole film and that's that's you almost you almost, you almost wish like like the camera would like Darken out their face a bit so their eyes are more shine more on screen. I don't even know what it is. I'm, I'm not. A, I'm not a filmmaker, but um, he took a lot of inspiration from films like Bullet that he worked on, and yeah, he put them on screen in, in a wonderful way in this movie. Not not in the daylight, in the dark. A lot of this is shot in the dark, and it's it's amazing to watch. And people like uh, Quentin Tarantino and um, Nicholas. What, what was it? Winding Refn. Winding Refn. Yeah, made yeah. made drive. I just watched it before we watched the show, and I, I forgot how much I enjoyed that movie. But he took parts of the, that movie, and you know, except it's a lot more bloody <laughs> than this movie yeah, is. A lot more. <laughs> and I forgot about all the bloodiest of that movie, but I don't want to get into that because we we're probably gonna do a little review of that uh, for for you, Lucky Legion Patreon uh, uh, supporters. Um. Yeah, but fun times, man. Um, great, great action. I mean, the, he, he, Walter Hill talked about that uh, he thought that the first car chase was a failure because they basically had to cut it together because they had several accidents. An electrician fell on, on set during during that scene, so that messed things up. And <clears throat> so, for something that's cobbled together, that 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 car chase scene is a is a great cinematic thing to see. And um. 
Yeah, you would kind of, never know it by what's on on the screen. Yeah, that it was I'm, just I'm cobbled together like that. Uh, I'm wondering what I'm wondering what he thought a success would be when it comes to that opening scene because it's fucking great. I, I don't get it. <laughs> One of the best car chases from the fucking seventies ever, and that's no small mm. feat. Yeah. Because it, it utilizes that same thing in Bullet, right? Where you have the camera like either in the car or like right on the hood of the car or whatever. So you got you got these really great POV shots that put you basically in the car with the people and, and help sort of ramp the tension up and 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 makes basically makes the viewer on edge because it you start, you know, losing yourself in it and feeling like shit, something could happen to me kind of thing. Yeah, it makes you feel like you're in the car, mm-hmm. you know, like you're, you're you're wanting to kind of duck and dodge and, and kind of move around with it, you know? Yeah. Well, we really didn't do this last time, but I'm going to ask you guys, you got any particularly favorite scenes or uh, favorite exchanges throughout the film? I'm going to start with you, Cameron. Oh, God, uh, where to start? Um that that opening car chase is, is probably one of the 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 main reasons to watch this film and the final car chase, without giving away you know spoiler wise you know what happens in those it's it's tense you know it's tension filled, and ultimately just you know a lot of people always mention the French Connection, it's you know having mm-hmm. one of the best you know car chases ever I I think this rivals it. You know, it's right up there. I mean, you know, and I love me some Smokey and the Bandit, but, you know, let's face it, those car chases were not, like, choreographed particularly spectacular. This is meticulously uh, edited. Uh, I love it from a technical standpoint. So those two scenes and the the scene with, uh, oh, what's his name? Teeth, when he uh, takes the gun to Ronnie Blakely's character, the the connection. That's chilling. Like when he puts the gun in her mouth and everything just goes silent, he doesn't have to say a word. You know, it's it's a chilling scene. It's it's haunting. Yeah, um, yeah. Those probably the three highlights. And Isabella Johnny, I, I, I love watching her in, in anything. She doesn't even have to to do anything. She could just be like thumbing through the phone book, and I'd watch it. Yeah, brother Lee, what do you think, brother? Lee, what's some of your favorite um... three things? I mean, I, I I definitely second the the car chases. I mean, it, both the the opening and in final car chase, but also the um, the show, the sort of you know the job adi- uh, the job audition he does for for the new crew that's picking him up in the <laughs> in, in where he he basically you know they they question how good he is, so he fucks up their car and and while they're in it you know and, and basically scares the shit out of them while he's doing it. I thought that was great. Like, I love that uh, Ryan O'Neill is so above these common criminals. Like, he holds himself to a greater standard than than he considers, you know, they do. Like, he doesn't trust them. And he always – he's always very upfront at dictating his terms and stuff like that. So he he's basically just showing them, don't fuck around with me, basically. And so that scene, I love – just his interactions with the criminals. Um, we've got, you know, Glasses, who is the leader of the new crew that uh, he's going to be working for. Uh, he's kind of, he's kind of, he, he reminds me of Clarence Boddicker, but he's not, you know, he's not as yes. uh, assertive and aggressive as Clarence Boddicker. Like he's, he's a guy who can be pushed around by the cops and the cops, you know, Bruce Dern uses him as, as uh, bait basically to try to catch the driver. Um, you know, because they, you know, after their initial robbery that they do, uh, Bruce Bruce Dern picks them up. Like they catch, they catch, they fucking catch them because their getaway driver wasn't as good, <laughs> and um, and so he makes a deal with them. Basically, you set up the driver for me and bring him to me, and I'll let you get out of this with your ass. Which Bruce Dern ain't gonna let him get away. Like the, like he he's just giving them false promises and leading them on. And at one point. Glasses tries to assert dominance on Bruce Dern on the rooftop there, where it's like, you know, we're doing this bank job, and if I see any fucking cops, I'm going to start shooting. Bruce Dern grabs him and threatens to throw him off the fucking building. If you shoot at anybody, I'm going to fucking kill you, dude, basically. And and the guy just backs down. Like, he's, he's actually kind of meek. And I, I like that the criminals in this uh, 
they're very realistic criminals. Like they feel like real people who just have sort of fallen into crime because they got nothing else going on for them. So you got like glasses who maybe before this was like selling cars or was like, you know, working at a home Depot or some shit. And, and he just sort of falls into crime and, um, teeth who is a stone cold psychopath. Uh, the driver underestimates the fact that he's a psychopath. Uh, he, he thinks he can kind of like, you know, put him in his place too. And he doesn't. And, uh, that's, that sort of like drives a lot of the, uh, plot points going towards the end of the film. And, um, it, it, it's, it's like, everything's very minimalist and, and, and stripped down, but at the same time, it, it, there's still a nice little level of complexity in the script and things flow interestingly enough that, um, I just, I just really appreciate it. Like, it, this could be just style above substance, but I think there's actually substance underneath all the style. So I like it a lot. Yeah, the the, the soundtrack to me works real well with the film. It's it's like, it feels like, like Barry Devorzen, but it's not Barry Devorzen because you get the it's whole my, uh, yeah, it's Michael Small. Yeah, you you get the whole um like the whole techno kind of deal, like like a lot of synth in there kind of reminiscent of what Tangerine Dream would do, you know, in, 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 in those years and in further years. And it felt like a Tangerine Dream uh, score to me, but it wasn't. But anyway, um, I, I love the interactions between the driver and, and, and the, with the detective because they, they clearly know each other. He clearly knows that he's capable of doing what he did or, or did what he did. He's just waiting waiting for that thing all the way up till the end when the, the locker scene happens. <clears throat> and even then he thinks he's got him, but he doesn't have him. And, and yeah, I, lo- I love that, that, that idea of him playing, playing the, 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 the sheriff, the lawman in a big city. Cause he, mm-hmm. re- he refers to him as the cowboy. Yeah. Where you, he, he's, he's the sheriff of, of, of I guess La- La- Los Angeles. You know, um, it, it's <laughs> it, it, it it works so well. I mean, you you wouldn't think it works so well in like a big cityscape like it is, but um, it, it is so strange in a film like this. It has like like uh, Pontiac Trans Ams and I think like Camaros in it and Ford Galaxies. Which I love my my favorite car chase involved the pickup truck. <laughs> I, I think I blame Cobra for that. That my favorite car chase <laughs> involves a pickup truck. But uh, that that Chevy C10 was a pretty sweet ride. It had the short bed on it, and he knew what he was doing. He knew how to drive that thing. And I, I love the fact that you know, even when he's in a something that could possibly you know, fish tail on the road, he, he knows how to control anything that he's in, any situation that he's in. Yeah. Until of course he gets screwed over by glasses, and uh, that's the whole point of his character. Is that <clears throat> detective mixes it up with the criminals to, to, to catch a bigger fish and and of course he the driver sees right through it almost because he immediately starts dismissing his crew like you know I don't like this guy he's got to go kind of deal you know I'm not feeling this guy and just just the best at feeling out situations and with, without that I don't think it'll work so well I mean I, I with, without I, I think um I think I read, you know, because this, this is casting stuff, that because Bronson has such a hard time with, with um, Walter Hill on Hard Times, <clears throat> he was trying to put the kibosh on Ryan O'Neill getting cast in this movie. But Ryan O'Neill was, was a bigger man than that. He, he chose to get to know Walter Hill first before he said yes, and, you know, the rest is history there, so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the best decision he ever made, I tell you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it it is it is pretty well documented. You know, the sort of little tension between Bronson and Hill, and you know, just because he he didn't like how he edited Jill Ireland's performance in Hard Times, right? So, um, but I mean, I kind of I kind of feel like Bronson wouldn't have worked as well in in the way this film's presented. Like this this is this is kind of a really different style than the stuff Bronson was doing in the seventies. So I, I, yeah. So, and I, and I feel, you know, putting Ryan O'Neill against type here, you know, although, you know, you could, you could, uh, 
you could kind of make this like the sequel to Love Story if if you really wanted to. Like, you know, he's sad that his woman died and now he's just sad getaway driver and he's the best getaway driver in Los Angeles. And, you know, <laughs> he's, he's, he's funneled that sadness into a new profession where, you know, he's a stalwart professional or whatever. But, um, yeah, no, it, 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 it works. And, I mean, they also wanted to have uh, Robert Mitchum as the Bruce Dern part, which can you can you can, like think of how like just different this movie would be if it was Charles Bronson and Robert Mitchum? I'm not saying it's going to be a bad movie. But it would be like a fundamentally different movie because you got two tough guys bouncing heads here where it's different in this one where you've got, you know, a cold professional and you've got this manic asshole cop who is, you know, glory seeking and just won't take no for an answer kind of thing. Whereas, you know, like at this point, Robert Robert Mitchum was like doing these sleepy detective movies and stuff in the 70s and. And like barely moving half the time, like it, it would just be a totally different energy. I mean, I think it still would have been a, a good film, but it would, yeah, have, it, again, di- totally different energy, totally different kind of film. And I had read while well, uh, researching for this that they had uh, considered Sylvester Stallone at the time, but he was busy doing Fist. And I can't, <laughs> I, I can't imagine. I mean, I can imagine Stallone, you know, be, being in it, but again totally different kind of a film we would have ended up with. <laughs> I'm the getaway driver. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 yo, I we're going to drive this pickup truck, eh? Yeah. Huh. Uh, you were, huh. There's not going to be another job because you were late. <laughs> yeah, my, my name is Marion. You got a problem with that? Yeah. <laughs> hey. <laughs> well, uh, one more round. Oh, wait, wrong movie. Wrong movie. <laughs> you want me to do the job? I'll do the job. <laughs> I'll do all the jobs. I'll do the job. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see that movie now, honestly. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah, I, I would love an alternate reality where we had, you know, uh, Sylvester Stallone and then Robert Mitchum. That would have been. Oh, fun. yeah. See, that would play well. That would play well. That would be a nice, good contrast. But when you got two, like, silent, tough guys going up against each other, it's just like, okay. It's going to be interesting, but it's not going to be this movie. It's it's not going to be what this movie turned out to be. So, I I think you know without Bruce Stern's Columbo like you know sarcasm in this movie, you know c- kind of <laughs> playing it cool like you know because he never really loses his cool. He, he, as frustrated as he is to to catch the guy that's never been caught, there's only like one part of the movie. To where he loses his cool, and that's during that like that first interrogation scene where he's in the lineup, and after the yeah, aftermath after, after that, where nobody wants to tell on him, and because mm. he, only... he realizes he's, he realizes he's getting fucked with, right? Mm-hmm. He, he 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 knows right away that Isabella Johnny had been paid off, so he's really yeah. pissed by that. But he only really raises his voice that one time, like where you know, I think he like hits the table or he he hits his chair, and Ryan O'Neill. Gets up because he thinks he's gonna, you know, and it's in the trailer, you know, you know, take a swing. That'll give you two years, you know, kind of deal. Like he's desperate, he's <laughs> mm-hmm. chomping at the bit for him to do something so he can charge him with something. Yeah. Well, well Bruce Stern's character, he's ready to do anything. He's ready to pretty much break every rule, break every law himself as the detective to, to go ahead and and catch this guy. And you, you're kind of waiting for him to go go nuts and cut loose a little bit but he never quite you know breaks you, you know he he manages to keep it cool enough but man bruce stern craziest eyes in the fucking business man if mm-hmm. anybody could give you a cold dead-eyed stare is that man it, it, it feels like his character is like so he's got a bit of power in the police force like you know he he's running this operation basically autonomous uh, you know to some degree but at the same time, you feel like he's kind of flying under the radar. Like, if anyone really complains, he's fucked. If he fails, he's fucked. But he's got, you know, he's got one guy who's his partner, who obviously has been a long time partner, who's kind of like this meeker version of Joe Friday kind of type <laughs> cop, right? <laughs> that, that, who's, you buy the books. There. Yeah, nothing but the facts, right? And yeah. then they got the younger guy who's like, what in the fuck are you doing? And and so he has to, like, kind of wrangle this guy in, like, now, listen, asshole, if, if, if you stick with me, you'll get you'll get a collar, 
You'll get some of the glory of this big catch and shit. So, you know, just stick with me. I'm going to get results, basically. And at the same time, he's, you know, as much as he's promising this stuff, he's browbeating the guy and just trying to keep him silent. But by the end, where, you know, he's literally left holding the bag, which, you know, is, is a nice little visual joke from Walter Hill here. Uh, that cop looks at him for a good, like, 30 seconds straight, like, oh, you're down. Like, I'm going to... I'm going to talk to our superiors about this shit. You fucked up royally, basically. And, and you know, Bruce Stern isn't all that upset about it. He's just like, he's more upset that he got beat by the driver, which is is the big thing. It's it's all the game for him. He, he's all into playing the game. Like, at one point, you know, he, he, he just prompts it forward because Ryan O'Neill is not going to go with this new crew. And so he goes and finds Ryan O'Neill and taunts him, basically. Like, if you know, if you don't do this next job, you know you're you're quitting basically like you're admitting defeat and it so it becomes this cat and mouse thing between the two that's uh one of the most interesting sort of like central points of this yeah that that that, that pecker contest if you will you know the the who's gonna mm-hmm. who's gonna best too because he you could tell you the way both of them are really fighting to, to to make this happen and what you get that churn of the film to where glasses you know fucks up he's he's got the he's got the bag of money and you know he get the rendezvous to get paid of course the double cross happens and i thought it was really cool to read mm-hmm. in the trivia that the gun that ryan ryan O'Neill was using was some old 1890 like cult peacemaker or something yeah 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 and it, it, he makes him you know break his code it's like almost like he was prepared for this guy to fuck him over so he brought a piece with him and the fact that it's like yeah. that old west type gun is it's uh, yeah he like he he tells he tells the uh the connection uh Ronnie Blakely's character I don't like guns like I don't like working with people who use guns and kill people but he never said he wouldn't use a gun he just said he doesn't like them he's always prepared that's the thing like he he is the he is the professional who is above all these fuckers like he's always prepared for any sort of you know, uh, variance in what happens basically. So, um, and that, that's a really cool scene and it's just so simple and just like so quick. It's not like an extended gunfight or some bullshit. It's just like glasses pulls on him, and he just pulls the gun out of his fucking, I, I assume, you know, the, the pocket in the, uh, in the door of the car pulls the gun out and just shoots him and it's, it's done. Yeah, the fact that, you know, there's there's a scene where this money changes hands because he, he puts it in a, a locker at the train station, which is a, a set piece of this movie. They're on the train, the detective's on the train with with his men, and they're looking for this bag. And I'm sure the fact that he has his hands on the money at some point in time during this exchange really drove him nuts, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could, like, physically see his skin, skin crawl at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> boy yeah i mean there, there's some great technical stuff besides the, the, the gun stuff I and mean, that they use I, I don't even know i'm sure they had their permission this is, wasn't done like larry cohen style or something like that uh. <laughs> it feels like it sometimes right like they're going into these open warehouses and stuff like like i like how the car chases they start you know open in the streets and as they go along they get more confined basically like they they go to smaller spaces and that's where you get to really see his talent as a driver. So, like, when you get to that final car chase where it gets into those warehouses and they're basically, you know, just, like, du- ducking and dodging between, like, rows in a warehouse of, like, you know, product or whatever the fuck sitting in the warehouse. Like, at one point, you see a bunch of color TVs stacked somewhere, boxes of color TVs. And I'm like, how does no one just walk into this warehouse and take these fucking color TVs? Like, <laughs> right. it's, it's fucking Los Angeles, like... You, you just have like a gang could like easily sneak into this warehouse that's apparently it's all lit but it's unpopulated by anybody like you don't see another person in it and it's like yeah, you, there's you no security e- there's no mm-hmm. security whatsoever no you could easily walk in grab like three or four color tvs really quick go and sell them on the street but you know that that's uh that's uh thinking a little too hard on this stuff it's all about the set pieces and so he has that basically that car versus truck duel in that warehouse where, you know, he gets the better, you know, they're, they're sort of like searching around and finally Ryan O'Neill's like, you know what, fuck it. 
to get out of this fucking warehouse, they got to come through the fucking gate and get out. So I'm just going to wait here for him. And then he, you know, plays chicken with him basically. And, <laughs> and runs him off the fucking thing into the little culvert or whatever on the side of the warehouse. Oh, it's such a sad end for that firebird, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You knew I, it was coming though. You knew it was fucking coming. <laughs> I, I love, I love the end of the exchange though, because he shoots, you know, the, 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 the criminal, but the driver, he, he, he understands because he says, you know, you know, I'm just a driver. It's almost like I, I understand your situation, you know, and I get the fuck out of here. You know, kind of deal. I, I like that exchange that he let him go. Yeah, yeah there's, he, he, uh... oh, go ahead. I was going to say, he doesn't have to say a word about it. It's almost that silent exchange, which, I mean, I think I read that Ryan O'Neill doesn't even say 300, 350 words in the movie. He yeah. says everything with his eyes. He's, his eyes basically says, like, beat your fucking feet and get the fuck out of here. Yeah. And he's like, there's, you know. There, there's, there's a professional courtesy there because actually, like, that guy who's the kid in the, uh, in the credits uh, – he's actually a pretty good getaway driver. Like he, he's, he's pretty much matches Ryan O'Neill step for step uh, in that final chase scene. It's just the fact that, you know, that car ain't going to stand up against going head on against a fucking big truck. That's, that's the kind of the only difference there. Uh, so it's like kind of, you know, game respects game a little bit kind of in, in, I think in, in that thing, although, you know, Ryan O'Neill is never going to say that to the guy. He's just giving him like that cold, dead, stare like get the fuck out of here before i shoot you too basically but you know yeah like you said earlier it's just like it's just a professional courtesy get the fuck out yeah a uh, couple quick notes on this movie uh isabella johnny no matter how much we loved her you know in this movie it's her first american role and she didn't care for the roles that she got afterwards so she kind of regrets this role and i think that's that's a wrong thing to say, but if you, you feel, you feel, you know, it, the film wasn't crazy successful, it, like, like, like Hard Times was, though. Yeah, she, and I mean, to be fair, like, this is probably my only negative. She doesn't get enough to do, like, other than basically her porcelain doll beauty filling out a really smart suit. She doesn't get a lot to do. And I think I think kind of the same for Ronnie Blakely. Like, they're kind of afterthoughts a little bit, in a way, uh, to the plot, but... Um, yeah, I mean, they're still really good performances for what they're given. And it, it is a shame that, you know, if this it did, did indeed hurt her career, that that's a, that's a real shame. Cause this is a really great movie. So, yeah. Yeah. He, um, if you, there's a little video on YouTube that you can watch like a promotional video for the driver. I wanted to use a piece of this kind of hard to pull a piece off there. Cause it's, it's kind of crappy quality of the audio. But um, Bruce Stern uh, thought it was really cool that Isabella Johnny and Ronnie Blakely were like two female gangster characters in a film like this, and that doesn't happen very often. And mm -hmm. he, he compared them to, to young Betty Davises within the movie, so that was a nice compliment to, to give to them. Yeah, yes. that's that's true. It's a, it's a good uh, you know comparison there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, also, we we didn't mention we mentioned on the take one of this episode. This is the first appearance of Torchies in any Walter Hill film. It's a real mm -hmm. it's a real cutaway shot. But you can see the sign big and bright. You know they came out of there. Bruce Stern and his and his partner. Um, first appearance Bruce of Stern playing uh, cool <laughs> very badly. Yes, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and not really giving a fuck about crime because he, he, his partner's like, yeah, we got two eleven and proud here, and um. Yeah, yeah, it's at the casino. I, I know, I know. Like the whole thing, and he's he's playing it cool, like almost always, like. I'm yeah. sorry. You know, he already knows that the driver's going to be long gone, so he's like, "I, ain't, you know, I ain't in a hurry." Yeah, I'll take my time. I mean, w w without without Darren, you wouldn't have that sarcasm. If if it was if mm -hmm. it was Robert Mitchum, all all due respect for his entire catalog for for the most part, but if you didn't have that Bruce Dern. Uh, as he calls it, doing a Dernsey like throughout this entire film, you know, uh, it wouldn't be the same. No, he's like he plays like I. He always plays a guy who's a high-toned son of a bitch, but at the same time he keeps it under control for the most part. You know, not always, but for the most part. 
yeah, usually the tension is like you're kind of expecting him to explode at some point. So that, like that's always that's why you're always watching him. You're like, shit, when's this guy going to go off the fucking rails? Yeah, it's like watching a bomb with the fuse continuously burning, and it's just like, when is it going to go? When's it going to go off? <laughs> he's he's a walking, talking MacGuffin in a film. Basically, is what he is. <laughs> right, right. Um, no, that's not the right. That's not the right fucking. That's not the right. Uh, I, I was thinking hit. I was thinking Hitchcock. I was just thinking the the suspense of you know there's a bomb under the table. Kind of thing. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's not that's not the MacGuffin. Uh, first appearance, you get you blink and you miss him. But Peter Jason shows up in this movie, and uh, oh, if you don't know who he is, he's been in multiple Walter Hill films. Multiple John Carpenter films, multiple Coen Brothers films. Yes, and this is a guy that shows up, you know, and things. And you've seen his face before. If you take a look at the IMDb, a picture of him, or you Google a picture of Peter Jason, like, yeah, oh, it's that guy. It's the the leader yeah, of the yeah. guy in the homeless camp, and they live and stuff like that, you know. Mm-hmm. He's yeah, been he's been a lot of he's stuff. He's in fucking Deadwood for crying out loud. Oh yeah, mm. this is also one one of two appearances by Tara King as the character Frizzy in a Walter Hill film too. Uh, she's she's the uh, I think the hotel clerk the the female hotel clerk who you know asks oh. uh, asks Ryan O'Neill do you want television in your room and he just sort of looks at her he's like no. <laughs> it's an extra dollar. It's yeah, a, it's almost like I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go jerk off. I ain't gonna be here too long, honey. You know. <laughs> mm. But she but she plays a character also named Frizzy in Forty Eight Hours. So uh, maybe same universe. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean bet. Torchies does make an appearance in Forty Eight Hours, so yeah, you know mm-hmm. it could be. Also, the I made note that it's the second appearance in, in two movies of uh, Walter Hill's and Nick Dimitri. He was one of the mm-hmm. opening a couple of uh, uh, thieves from the casino. Yeah, yeah. Oh boy, man, we said a lot about this movie, and uh, I, I think rightfully so. Uh, any any final things you want to say about the film? I'll let you guys go now, Cameron. Go for it, brother. Um, I don't, I don't know what I can say that we haven't said already. It's it's you know it's mostly filled with a cast of uh, unknowns. I wouldn't say unknowns or lesser knowns, you know. I mean, Bob Miner, Nick Dimitri, always great second fiddle characters, you know, uh, great stuntmen and, and, and tough guys. Uh, Bruce Dern. Uh, Bruce Dern is the MVP here. I mm-hmm. like to use that term a lot, but he, he he sells the film for me. I love watching Bruce Dern work, and he's just, he, he's like, you know, like I said, he's like watching a powder keg that's just about to go off. You're just watching that fuse burn, and you're just like, when is it going to blow? And you know, I, I wish I had watched this more over the years. It's just one that I always seem to revisit once every five or ten years or so. Uh, I need to buy a copy of it, but it's it's just oozes style, and, and it's not saying that it's style over substance, you know. But I think it's it, it treats the audience like it's intelligent. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of action movies, a lot of crime thrillers, you know, they they don't necessarily treat the the audience uh, like they're intelligent. They treat the audience like they're kind of dummies, I think, a lot of times. But this one, it, it has the perfect mix of style and substance, and it's a great. You know, I mean, his next movie, you know, would be his magnum opus with the Warriors. But I think what a what a start. You know, from hard times to this to the the Warriors, a, a trio of films that I mean, who else can say that they came out of the gate like this? Um, and it makes me like Ryan O'Neill. So I mean, <laughs> you know, for, for, for once, you know, he, he's just an actor that I just don't tend to like. No offense, Miss Mr. O'Neill, but just not one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> But it's yeah, it's 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 great if you're looking for a movie that's a little bit off the beaten track, and a little bit different, you know, and that has inspired so many other people, you know, that we've already mentioned. Uh, I implore people if you have not seen this in uh, Walter Hill's filmography, please, please go check it out. It's 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 one of his most under uh, underappreciated gems, I think. And I'll leave it at that. Lee. If you like Baby Driver, if you like Drive, if you like the Transporter films, anything about, you know, a super professional who, you know, has his own code and just does it in completely amazing style throughout the entire film, um, you owe yourself to see this film. You, you need to see, you know, some of the, I'm not going to say the total DNA of that sort of genre offshoot, but 
it's it's definitely an important part of the DNA of that because Walter Hill really brings a lot of elements together in this film that previously weren't brought together and influenced quite a few films because of it. And it is just it it also it's 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 an hour and a half. It's 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 a very tight, fast little action movie with uh, excellent performances, especially considering that their characters aren't super deep, but they're still giving really great performances and making you watch them. They're basically more archetypes than characters, you know, but um, it, it is just fucking a great film. And it's one that, you know, like Cameron was saying, a lot of people don't really know about, like they, they, you know, it's, it's very, sadly overlooked quite a bit and it shouldn't be because it's a fucking great film and uh i say see it uh it, there there are multiple blu-ray and dvd copies out there it's on itunes um it's not super widespread uh, as a lot of movies are unfortunately but there are ways to find it so do yourself a favor and find it yeah you you mentioned these releases i mean the only american blu-ray they have out there is that the it, it, pay through your teeth to find it probably really shitty quality twilight time uh blu-ray and that has the alternate right. opening on it and isolated music score and that's about it um but otherwise you know studio canal made a real nice print of this movie and i'm sure around these foreign blu-rays that unless you have a region free player you can't play so you're pretty much stuck with the bare bones you know sony uh dvd which is it's not shameful, but we're living in a world to where it's gonna, it, the world's going to catch up to the driver. And I, I'm looking for Kino, and I'm looking for mm-hmm. somebody like that to put out a nice print of the movie with some nice extras on there. And um, so we could all enjoy it, it, because this film deserves to be seen big. Like, not yeah. like 1080p, you know, beautiful transfer, because it's all, it's all there on the screen. It's all there. And in, 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 in the, there's no effect shots in this movie. They're all cars ramming into each other, and it's it's a uh, it's just like it's just a good film. And like Lee said, that the runtime is tight. It's like an hour thirty two minutes. This, this film today would be two hours and twenty minutes. It would have you know extra scenes in there that you, you really don't need. I think every nothing is wasted in this hour and a half. Is what I'll say about that. The oh other? yeah, there's like virtually no fluff in this movie. Virtually none. Mm. The ori- yeah, the original cut was like over two hours or something like that. He's got a, he's got a problem with that, doesn't he? With making these these long cuts of the movie. Mm. <laughs> but I think he had a little more. Because per- he, he, cut, he cut because um, he cut uh, exploitation actress Cheryl Smith. He cut her entire like subplot out of the film. Like she was like. I get I, I, it, it's it's assumed like I've seen some people assume that, you know, uh, she's like the girlfriend of uh, Fingers, who is the young getaway driver who gets replaced by Ryan O'Neill with the crew and, and gets shot in the bank. Apparently in like some sort of novelization of the story or whatever, he survives or I think this might have been based on a book, actually, or, or something like that, or maybe in the original script. I can't remember, but. Um, either way, like it, it seems like she was probably like the girlfriend and he like he crawls home alive, apparently with his gut shot. And, uh, yeah, but that was all exercised. And honestly, I'm kind of glad it was. Yeah, me too. I mean, without the tight run time, I think it, it would, it would hurt the film. And I, you're with it all the time. And I, I gotta, I gotta say that, that, that is one of the film's biggest strengths is that it keeps you on yeah. your toes the whole time. You're wondering what's going to happen next with this one, that one, and that one. And yeah, I mean that, that that's that's about it for this one, guys. And I, I'm gonna kick it to these gentlemen now. They have some some lovely shows, that, other shows you should be listening to besides this one, of course. Uh, Lee, uh, tell us all about it, man. All right, uh, if you like what you heard here, you can hear more of it on my shows. Uh, they must be destroyed on site. Go to tmbdos.podbean.com and you'll find that and you'll find my sort of side podcasts and stuff as well. And uh, yeah, all that stuff's there. Cool, Cameron. Uh, Well, still kicking it at Cinema Degeneration. We've got a whole network of shows that I do there. Uh, Grindhouse Pizzeria, Sequel 2, Deja Vu, Howling at the Full Moon. i got a couple of other ones in the works and I actually have a film premiere, which will probably happen but by the time this comes out i'm not sure if it will or not but uh the embalmers is screening at the skyline drive-in uh next wednesday so that's what i got going on 
I'm excited for that. <laughs> Very excited for you, big, sir. Big screen at the drive-in. <laughs> Very excited for you, man. It's amazing. That's awesome. Um, yeah, me, Pacific Beef Podcast, two drink minimum commentaries. This show, Burning for Springwood, we just recorded a new, new episode of Burning for Springwood. Me and Mike Merriman, uh, Suzanne had to sit out because she was exhausted, getting getting tagged by the dream, man. Are you man. doing that one again? We're doing that one again, man. We I, we, <laughs> we started up again. Awesome. You know. I love that show. So that uh, new episode of that coming very, very soon. Uh, all that can be found at legionpodcast.com. Cool. Blood from the Core, uh, the show I do with uh, D- Derek Boo Boo Bourgeois. Um, <laughs> Derek Boo Boo Bourgeois, I call him all day long. Uh, that's a show about New York City based horror and thriller films. That can be found on Legion Patreon, which uh, you pay, I think it's $2 a month minimum. You get all the great content, yeah. including that. You get uh, courts unedited. Uh, un- unrestrained uh, music episodes, you know, the, for for his show and uh, Ouija experiment, uh, exclusive commentaries, exclusive Friday Nightmares episodes. There's there's some stuff on there you guys can grab and and uh, enjoy. Bo Ransdale himself will give you a hand job sometime in the coming year. Man, Bo's great, good at them handies, ain't he? Just throwing out there, you mm-hmm. know. Yeah, the good old fashioned, right? Good, good, good old exactly. fashioned Western grip hand job. You know, come on now. <laughs> Uh, and for an, for an extra dollar, he'll do it with his left hand. Man. Exactly. Ambidextrous. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, those shows are uh, all, all on Legion, man. Those are all coming at you. And uh, if you're, this is a long ways away, but they just announced this, and I'm very excited. If you're in Chicago land in November, and you don't go to Days of the Dead to go meet Bruce Stern, there's something wrong with you. Because you're going to go meet a legend. A legend of legends, you know. It'll give you the crazy eye. Man, I, I expect the crazy eye, and uh, I'm going to love that shit, man. It's, it's uh, you Expect a goofy picture, I'm <laughs> the sure. The first show, first show I recorded was on the Incredible Two-Headed Transplant, and that's Bruce Dern at some of his craziest things. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, but this has been Last Call of Torchy, so uh, we hope you've enjoyed your time with us. We've enjoyed uh, our time talking about this, and... Uh, We'll see you all next time with the Warriors, y'all. Come out to play. <laughs> uh, stick this bat up your ass and turn you into a pop. Yeah, that's going to happen the whole